In this video, we will go through punch and shear in the SLB software. We will go through the required inputs that are needed to view the results. We will see how to view the results in the report. Then we will go through the calculation procedure in detail so that we're aware of the various assumptions and limitations of punch and shear in the SLB software. The punch and shear inputs are set under input, material properties, and punch and shear. So the concrete grade is set in the slab concrete type table that was covered in a previous video. And the punching shear parameters are input here. So the ties yield stress, if closed ties are to be designed and their diameter, and the cover. And whether or not we apply the minimum moment for punching shear calculations. So hitting cancel. <coughs> To view the punching shear results, we must have analysis an analysis complete. We must have results performed. So that is under solve, analyze, and design. In this case, that's already been completed. Uh, to view the results, we go to results, punching shear, and we have the option of current case or envelope. So current case being the current case or combination shown in the properties tab, and envelope being the load combinations that were set as envelopes. So in this case, if we go to input load factors, it will be the 1.2G, 1.5Q case and the 1.35G case. So to view the results, we go results, punching shear, and we'll choose envelope. Now we have the option to show the results for the static reactions and for the area reactions. So static and area reactions are discussed in their separate video. Hitting plus on screen, plus to make the text bigger on screen. What we see here is a safety factor in the X and Y, and what the safety factor corresponds to is the um, 0.7 VU over V star. So essentially the, um, the capacity of the concrete. So greater than one, the concrete has enough capacity to resist punching shear. Less than one, it does not. And we may need to design it with closed ties or with shear studs. So visual inspection, we see that if we zoom in, this column is failing in the Y. This particular wall, due to its geometry, the software is unable to handle it. So we're seeing this, the fact that we're seeing a negative safety factor, that's what that means. So either we could do this by hand or just trim this wall back to the slab edge and reanalyze. Uh, looking, looking through, inspecting the various parts of the slab, we see the program automatically considers the shape of the column, rectangular, circular, complex, when calculating the perimeter. And it also picks up that it's close to the edge, so it will um, take a portion of the critical perimeter is ineffective, which is what it's doing here. Similarly with this column. If we zoom into this column, this column sits near a void, so the program recognizes that and then removes that portion of the critical punching shear perimeter automatically. Other assumptions that the program does is that if a wall is essentially a, a very has a very small length, it will be treated as a column and punching shear will be checked. So that is what has been performed for this particular wall. However, as this will form part of the shear call, we really could be ignoring that. But that is why we see these calculations for this wall element. Other assumptions of the punching shear calculator. <coughs> If a wall element touches a <coughs> if a wall element touches a column on its center, we assume that all of the the shear will be taken by the wall. Hence, we don't perform punching shear calculations on um, on these columns. So we have a wall element touching the center of the column here and here. And similarly for beams, if we have a beam element touching the center of a column, then we assume that the force will go into one-way beam shear in the beam and we do not check punching shear. So for this particular beam, the, uh, <coughs> the beam sits on the wall center on this end, hence there's no punching shear perimeter calculated, no punching shear check performed. But down this end, the beam, if we zoom in, the beam is some distance away from the column center, hence why we have checked punching shear here. Other things that the software does, typically the SLB software ignores columns and walls above. So if we just hit escape to redraw, 
selecting these columns we see that they're above these are below normally the SLB software will ignore columns above except for punch and shoot calculations so switching on point loads for the <coughs> superimposed dead load case they will have basically columns and walls above will have punching shear checked if they have a um, if they have a point load or a line load sort of at their center or along their cross section. So these columns do, therefore they will be checked. So if we go back to results, punching shear, and display the envelope again, this particular column hitting minus to make the text smaller. This particular column was checked above because there's a point load coming directly on top of it. However, this column above was not checked. The reason why it wasn't checked is that it is some distance, it is some acceptable distance away from the column below. So we assume that the, that point load of 100 kilonewtons, whatever it was, will be coming down and transferring directly across into this column via bearing. Uh, the, so the column underneath via bearing. The column underneath has pu has punching shear checked, but we assume that that 100 kilonewtons will be going directly in via bearing. So we should see that in the report. So this is a very quick overview of what we can see and how to display the results. So it's as simple as that. Input the settings and go to results and punching shear. Now we'll go through a series of slides to have a look at the calculation procedure for punching shear in more detail within SLB. Why we do this, it's important to understand what the program is doing so that we're aware of its limitations and so that we know when uh, the program's calculations do not apply to our particular case. So we'll be discussing um, punching shear calculations to AS3600-2009. The first thing that we'll look at is what the program doesn't consider. So the program can't pick up spandrel edge beams with ties. So if we have closed ties calculated for a spandrel beam, uh, the values c calculated by the program will be incorrect. The SLB software also cannot calculate shear heads, so basically I-beams cast into the slab and shear studs. Uh, however, if we have uh, these particular things, we can either use a separate software or an another design code. And the other thing that's not considered is the critical openings basically directly on top of the critical perimeter. So looking at the, uh, the screenshot from AS3600, <coughs> if we have a critical perimeter directly, if we have a critical opening directly on the critical perimeter, the program generally can pick it up depending on where it is. However, these projected openings some distance away from the critical perimeter the SLB software cannot pick these cases up. So if we have a column that is close to failing or failing, we have to perform a manual hand check for these cases. Now, how we determine the critical perimeter? We will first look at an example where we have a column below. So sitting on uh, a 400 thick slab, and there's a step in the bottom of the slab, and then it drops down to 200 here. So when the mesh is generated, uh, we generate find an element mesh to the center of the column and along this geometry line defining the areas of different thickness. And we basically have four find an element nodes touching the center of the column. Now it is the, uh, it is the thickness of these four find an element nodes that are used to determine the average, uh, the average slab depth. So in this case, it's 400 mil. And the cover plus one bar value is 32 millimeters, so uh, we have 12 mil bar in the slab. And from that, we calculate the D average value. Using the average depth from the previous slide, we calculate a first pass value D average on two. We then use this value to create eight points, which we then get the average depth of. And then we get the average effective depth of those eight points. Then, getting, then we divide that value by 2 to create the critical perimeter. So in this case, it's 146.5 millimeters. Next, we'll look at a similar, similar example, 
how we calculate the critical punch and shear perimeter, but in this case it's been modelled slightly differently. In this case the geometry line defining the 200 thick slab zone and the 400 thick slab zone has been modelled directly over the centre line of the column. So what this means now is that we have um, basically six finite element, six finite element triangles touching the centre of the slab and we have uh, basically three of them will have 200 thickness, three of them will have 400 thickness. So as we do previously, we calculate the um, we calculate the average the average depth the average depth of 300, and then we calculate the average effective depths. So going through the same process that we did previously, we now get a um, a critical perimeter at a distance of 134 millimeters away from the um, the face of the column. So what the, what these two examples showed is that depending on how we model the, um, the how we model the structure within SLB, we'll be getting different critical perimeters calculated. As shown in the SLB software, another assumption is that um, segments of the critical punching shear perimeter are taken as ineffective if they're 800 millimeters away from the slab edge. So this is recommended as per the American code. And the reason for this is that the basically the, the shear will not be able to flow around to the backward face of this column. So for this particular case, we take um, <coughs> we will take three sides as effective and here because this one's a bit closer to the edge only two sides will be effective for punching shear calculations. And as we saw previously when we show the results uh, the the text that we display on screen is just for the capacity of the concrete and um, as shown circular columns are calculated we take away the percent the part of the perimeter that's, ne that's next to avoid however in this particular case it was not able to pick up the um <coughs> it was not able to pick up based on its inbuilt tolerance as the fact that it was close to this edge and it included this part of the perimeter in its calculations so ideally we should check this column by hand similarly with this one it's not picking up that tiny segment that's sitting above an edge so if this column was working hard we, we should perform a hand check on this one Now, for those columns that are failing, so for the columns in red, the columns that have um, basically their concrete failing, we can open up the report, so that's under punch and shear report, and we can then attempt to design, we can attempt to design those columns with closed ties as per AS3600. AS so because it's torsion calculations, we automatically choose to design it with two legs. We also give you this additional column in the report, um, N legs. What N legs refers to is if you're going to detail it as a beam. So we, again, we always use the two vertical legs because it's a torsion calculation, but if you want to detail it as a beam, we tell you what the, um, the number of legs that you need as per the longitudinal spacing requirements of section eight to the code. And we perform all of the calculations, um, so for the calculation of VU min, the minimum capacity, the maximum capacity, and then the capacity uh, it's itself between maximum and, and minimum. So looking at the report, all of the values are displayed, and we see a message here. So for this particular column C38, we see a fail, meaning that V star is greater than VU max. So if we look at the equation for VU max, we can see that there's no concrete in there, no, uh, sorry, no steel in this in this calculation, meaning that um, increasing of the shear steel will not help the uh, the capacity in this particular case, and that we need to increase the slab depth. So that's what this is indicating to us. Similarly for column number one. Our commonly asked question that we receive in our support calls is um, what about, what do I do for punching shear for band beams? Um, when do I check it? When do I design it as a beam? When do I design it as a slab? Now, in respect to AS3600, <coughs> beams are covered in section 8. So typically they are sections with um, a greater 
greater depth than width and they predominantly act in one direction so basically they're checked for one way beam shear band beams so they're not they they're not clearly defined well they're not defined at all in AS 3600 so they have a width much greater than the slab depth and they exhibit behavior both of a two-way slab and of a one-way beam now do they um, do they have one-way beam shear or two-way slab punching shear? Uh, do we design for one or the other or both? Um, are we being conservative if we design for both? Now, the American Code ACI 318 may provide some guidance. So their clause 11.4.6 uh, basically outlines when minimum shear reinforcement is is not needed. So it's not needed in slabs, beams less than 250 millimeters, and as shown in C here, um, beams that satisfy this condition. So a beam cast integral with the slab, with an overall beam depth h not greater than 600 millimeters, and not greater than the maximum of 2.5 times the flange thickness and 0.5 times the web width. So here it is, those those conditions. So the logic is slabs don't need shear reinforcement for flexure and if a band beam satisfies the above conditions it can be treated as a slab. However, if it's treated as a slab it should be checked for punching shear as a slab. So we don't check for shear to section 8 but we check for punching shear to section 9. Now here's a beam versus band beam example. Here we have uh, two, two band beams, so in the SLB software they've been defined as areas of, um, basically of, of sla as slab zones with increased thickness. So more on beams and band beams in the, uh, in the beam video. Um, and basically because they've been modeled as thickened slab zones, the program doesn't know that it's, you know, that it's, that it's a band beam or a beam. It just sees um, increased thickness and automatically performs its punching sheet calculations. So band beam number one, 550 deep by 1750 wide. Beam number two, 800 deep by 1200 wide. And we can see that one of them is failing, um, well, they're both failing. One of them failing not so badly, so close to uh, the safety factor of one, but one of them is failing in a big way, so safety factor of 0.5, meaning there's the concrete doesn't have enough capacity, not even close. Why this one is probably failing badly? Probably because those eight points are shown in the previous slab start falling into slab zones that are much thinner, so they're not all going into this um, into this thicker thicker band beam segment. So applying though the check from applying the ACI check from the previous slide, band beam number one, basically a satisfaction of these conditions, so we can treat it as a slab. Therefore, we must reinforce for punching shear. So we don't we don't have to check one way one way beam shear, but we essentially have to consider the fact that um, this particular column will potentially be failing for punching shear, just the concrete, and we have to put in some um, some reinforcement for punching shear or some shear studs. Band beam number two, height greater than 600, so basically it will act as a beam in one-way beam shear. So we can ignore this punching shear re report, but we have to design and detail this, this uh, band beam as a uh, conventional one-way beam to section eight. And here's just a screenshot of the various references from the American code. So in summary, what we what we looked at, we saw how to display the punching shear results in SLB. So very simply, we just go to results punching shear. But we also looked in a bit more detail at the calculation procedure within the SLB program. Why we did this, we need to understand what the program is doing and the limitations of that so that we know when the scope of the program doesn't cover our particular case. And this concludes this video. Thank you for watching.